Before the 67 Act, one was inevitably conscious that one's living one's life, a hidden life, not just a hidden life, an illegal life, a criminal life. One was a criminal. The essential part, or one of the essential parts of one's life, was a criminal activity. So anybody, I'm afraid, who wants to look up Anthony's records and find the letters that we sent to one another, well, you may find the letters, but you won't find the letters because there weren't any letters. Because one of the things that one had to do in those days, if you had any sense, was not to write letters to one another. One of the things you learnt very quickly was the dangers of putting your contacts in your address book. One of the first things the police did if they arrested someone was to rush to look at their address book. For example, one of the things you may have noticed that when Turing was arrested, one of the things the police did was seize his address book. And that was the normal thing that happened when gay people were arrested. One of the first thing the police did was to seize their address books. After we met, we had flats in the same house. We decided that it was a little bit silly wasting money on two separate flats when we wanted to live together. So we decided to get a flat to share. Naively, I thought this would be an easy thing to do. It wasn't. It was very difficult in those days for two men to share flats together. At least one occasion when we actually thought we had rented a flat, when they realised that two men were going to be living there, they suddenly discovered they'd already lent it to somebody else, let it to somebody else, and it was terribly sorry. Mind you, you've got to remember this was the days when people used to have openly notices saying, no Irish, no blacks, no dogs. Uh, but eventually we did manage to, to get a flat together uh, in Broadhurst Gardens, a famous road, the same street where one of the founders of the first lesbian organisation, Arena 3, lived, and where 60 years previously, um, Franz Rove, the author of Hadrian the Seventh, had also lived. I recall once when we were living together in the flat in Broadhurst Gardens, we had a crash in the middle of the night we assumed that this was the chimney falling down. I rushed to the front window to have a look out to see what had happened. It wasn't a chimney, it was a car crash. A number of car crashes. A stream of cars round the road had all been collided together by a drunken bus driver. So obviously the thing one had to do was to ring the police and notify them there had been an accident, especially as our car had been ruined. But one didn't, not in those days. The first thing one did was get up, go to the spare room, make up a second bed, make it look as if it had been laid in, and then you rang the police. One of the difficulties sometimes was in knowing how to deal with neighbours. I guess this is a problem for everybody. Uh, a lot of the neighbours when we moved here, uh, we guess knew, or some of them were very friendly with and were actually told. But one of our next door neighbours we hadn't actually told specifically. And on an occasion when we had a television man coming to make in to do a recording of Anthony, um, we thought we'd better tell this particular neighbour uh, what the interview was about and why there was a television man here. Uh, very tentatively we said Anthony does work for Homosexual Law Reform Society and you, you, you do of course realise that we are a gay couple, don't you? wondering just what reaction you would get. The reaction was actually quite simple. She said, oh yes, when Philip and Philippa sold the house, they said they let it to a couple of queers. The three things that I think in general seem to cause people to object to gay, pe gay men in particular were first the religious objections, the feeling that the Bible said that homosexuality was evil Perhaps, as sometimes people argue, this is just because it was temple prostitution, but be that as it may, there was a religious objection. But I think there were two stronger objections politically, certainly in this country. First, a feeling that gay sex crossed classes. You will note that cases like the case of the uh, prosecutions that were taking place just before the Wolfen Report was appointed largely concentrated on people who were mixing with other classes. Lord Montague were the airmen. So 
So that's a second reason. The third reason, I think, is a feeling that gay men are letting the side down. Homosexuality was equivalent or equated with buggery. Buggery was one man fucking another, which meant that the other was taking the place of a woman. And women are inferior. You are letting the side down if you take the place of a woman. And that seemed to me to encapsulate a lot of the, not entirely hidden, but the underlying causes why people felt that homosexuality was wrong. The Sexual Offences Act 1967 was, of course, a result of the Wolfenden Report ten years earlier. It's amazing when you think about it that it took ten years. If you think of the fact that it took a century for provisions about people marrying deceased wife's sisters to get through the Commons, to get something as substantial as this through in ten years was quite an achievement. However, there were costs. Although the original intention of the those of us who drafted the Act had been simply to make homosexuality of itself legal, to get it through the Commons it seemed to be the case that we had to accept a lot of qualifications. First of all, it was restricted to adults, adults over 21, which was then the age of the majority. It was also restricted to activities in private, so the Act forbade cases where two or more pres people were present or things that took place in the public lavatory. Similarly, you've got lots of qualifications about people who took things and did things on merchant shipping. I think this was largely a reflection of some of the trade unions who on the whole were generally against anything like this. Such qualifications were of course something which upset Anthony very much but he was employed to get the act through and to get make, as it were, a breach in the dike, to make the creation of a situation on which other people could then build. It was particularly unfortunate that in view of his own strong objections to many of the qualifications, that people blamed him for them. This was far from the case. One of the main stages in the proceedings was when the act went through, or the draft of the act went through in the House of Lords, promoted by Lord Aaron. And I can still recall visiting him once at the weekend and sitting talking about what we should do about the Act. And in spite of everything that Anthony was pressing, Lord Aaron kept ringing up the Home Office to see whether they were willing to agree with it. My feeling was that the more you gave the opposition, the more they would ask for. Nevertheless, it turned out that the Act did get through it was a breach. It may not have been everything that we wanted, but it made the other things possible. When Anthony Gray left the Trust the first time, it freed him up, of course, to take a more active part in the sides of the gay life that interested him. The Albany Trust, are we talking about? The, yes, the Albany Trust. And one of the things we were able to do was to go to the very early, not the first, but the very early meetings of the Gay Liberation Front at the LSE. Um, it was one of those meetings where they were trying to decide what on earth to do. And Anthony suggested that as there had been a famous case of someone arrested for cottaging, Louis Eakes, a young liberal, it would be a good idea if GLF had a zap and actually did something instead of just talking to each other. To draw attention to the public, to the way that gay people were being persecuted. This got considerable support, and indeed it was the first time that GLF got itself in the public medium. However, it's got to be admitted, as some of the books have commented, that if some of the GLF people there had realized that it was Anthony who suggested it, somebody from what was then regarded and this is the dirty word you realise, as a respectable person, uh, they would probably not have done it at all. And it was a general feeling that although the work that the Homosexual Law Reform Society did made it possible for things like GLF to exist, they objected to their social, political parentage 
and wanted to think that they had started the world. And therefore people like Antony were by a part, a large part, though not all, of the GLF, regarded as non-persons. He sometimes described himself as the Trotsky of the movement. <laughs>